Thank you very much, Sean. I hadn't quite realized we were ignored to quite that extent. Uh, uh, thanks also very, to uh, Joe uh, for the invitation. It really is a, a pleasure and an honor. And I wish I had volunteered to go be, before Fiona. Uh, <laughs> but since I am the, uh, uh, the last speaker of the day, uh, I'm actually going to begin with a slightly risque uh, economics joke. Uh, so uh, please forgive me. Um, so uh, this little boy had been hearing a lot from Sean and others about the economy. He had no idea what it was all about. So he asked his, his dad, what's this whole uh, economy uh, thing about? So his dad thought for a second and he said, son, well, the economy is like this household. I provide the money, so I'm capital. The maid over there does all the work, so she's labor. Uh, your mother directs the maid, uh, so she's management. And you see your little brother over there, he's the future. Now, the boy didn't think this was a very good explanation at all, particularly the bit about his little brother being the future, but he decided to, to accept it. But in the middle of the night, he heard a terrible racket, um, and it seemed to be coming from his uh, baby brother's room. Uh, so he got up and walked down the corridor, and he first went into his parents' room. His father wasn't there, uh, uh, but his mother was fast asleep and just couldn't wake her up. Uh, so then he went down uh, further by the maid's room, and he saw his dad in there entertaining the maid. <laughs> and then he went into his baby's brother room, and he found what was causing all the problem. He was in terrible need of a, of a nappy change. So the little boy said, some economy this is. Management is asleep on the job. Capital is screwing labor, and the future stinks. <laughs> <laughs> So, so the Irish economy isn't, uh, isn't quite that uh, bad, certainly, and uh, we have been making a, a lot of progress, and I think it's uh, important to say that at the outset. Uh, a few years ago, it, uh, there was a lot of talk that the adjustment effort and the fiscal adjustment effort in particular was going to be uh, self-defeating in the sense that it would slow the economy so much that the fiscal situation uh, wouldn't improve. But we do see uh, our deficit coming down, uh, slowly but coming down. We do see uh, our debt level uh, stabilizing. There are tentative signs uh, that growth is returning. And a particularly welcome feature of the recovery is, is that employment growth has returned reasonably strongly and we see the unemployment rate coming down. Uh, and given that default uh, really was a real fear uh, as recently as the middle of 2011, at the time, uh, the, the financial markets, if you looked at the, the risk spreads, were pricing in something close to a 90% probability uh, of an Irish default. Uh, so the fact that Ireland has regained its uh, borrowing capacity and what are now actually record low interest rates uh, is really quite a dramatic turnaround. And it is significant that we've been able to exit the, uh, the, the bailout program uh, but rather than it really being, I think, an end in itself, uh, I think what's really significant about it is that it's a very welcome signal that the sort of vicious cycles that characterize the crisis uh, are being uh, turned around. Uh, and uh, in terms of being able to uh, avoid uh, default uh, and put the, uh, uh, the economy back on a path to recovery, key to that is having had the uh, capacity, both economic capacity, and political uh, capacity to make the needed adjustments. Now, that initially involved uh, the government following the conditions laid out in, in the program that it agreed with, with, the, with the Troika. Uh, but what's really taken over from that and what's really going to be my main uh, sort of theme uh, this evening uh, is a new fiscal framework uh, that's been put in place and I think is very poorly uh, uh, understood, um, but it really structures the way fiscal policy uh, is uh, to be conducted um, um, uh, now and, and uh, in the future. Uh, and adhering to that fiscal framework will hopefully really keep us on uh, that track uh, to recovery in what is still a very fragile environment, as the other uh, speakers have noted. Now, one key part of that framework uh, is that we get the deficit below 3% of GDP, which is supposed to happen next year, and then we exit this thing called the excessive deficit procedure. Uh, and it's now being made sound like that that's really all that's to it. Uh, and now it seems that we can achieve that with an adjustment uh, of less than uh, 2 uh, billion. Uh, 
But that is actually only just one part of the framework, and actually a more fundamental part of the framework is uh, what's referred to as the underlying structural adjustment uh, in, the, in the budget, and that's what the $2 billion is designed uh, to achieve. So there is a real sign of backtracking uh, from the framework. That commitment is fraying, and it's fraying at what really is a very early stage uh, in the recovery. We've gone through these cycles in the past, uh, as I've talked about before, these boom-bust uh, cycles that have been very pronounced in the Irish economy. So it is worrying to see uh, that commitment uh, to the, the, the framework, uh, which really uh, gives us the best chance uh, to stay on the path uh, to recovery. So we sort of in elaborating on this theme, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the risks that remain from uh, both uh, within and without, to, to borrow from the title of the, of the session. But since that ground has been uh, covered by other speakers, I'll be uh, very quick on that. I'm going to say a little bit about this fiscal framework, uh, which is very poorly understood in the sense of sort of why it exists, uh, and also uh, the, the, the value uh, that it has uh, for us. Uh, and then maybe, uh, if there's a little bit of time at the end, talk a little bit uh, about the, uh, the upcoming budget. So first of all, in terms of the risks, uh, we can think of there are risks around uh, growth, around financial conditions, uh, and uh, political risks. And each of these has both a domestic and an international uh, dimension. Uh, you know, others have talked about the, the, uh, the, the risks to, to the global economy. We are seeing signs of recovery. The UK is go going really strongly. The US uh, uh, doing reasonably well as well. Uh, the Eurozone economy is sort of uh, struggling uh, to, uh, to get off the ground. It looks like the IMF are actually going to uh, scale back the projections for growth in the, uh, in the global economy uh, tomorrow. And a major risk, as I think John uh, mentioned, is the risk of deflation uh, setting in or even very low inflation uh, setting in in the euro area. And it's not clear that the European Central Bank has either the means or possibly even the will uh, to do what is necessary to make sure uh, that that uh, uh, risk doesn't damage the European uh, recovery. Domestically, in, in terms of growth, uh, we're going through uh, what uh, economists call a balance sheet recession. And Fiona uh, talked about uh, many of the, uh, the, the elements of that. And one thing we know from the international evidence on these types of recessions uh, is that they can last an awful long time uh, and are prone to setbacks. And if you look at uh, domestic demand in the Irish economy, it's essentially been flat uh, since about 2010. Uh, so even this sort of recent surge in growth has really uh, so come about on the net export side. If you sort of look at the a graph uh, uh, of domestic demand, it really hasn't uh, turned around to any great extent yet. And again, uh, the interna international evidence cautions us uh, that there, there may be setbacks. On the finance side, uh, John uh, again uh, mentioned this, but we do see this pattern across the world where risk premiums and all sorts of assets have fallen to very low levels. Um, um, so, so what were considered sort of riskier investments, including Irish sovereign debt, uh, the, uh, uh, the risk pre premium required by investors to hold it uh, have fallen. Uh, and this partly reflects the, the actions of major central banks around the world, which have really flooded the, uh, the system uh, with uh, liquidity. Uh, and that's put um, um, interest rates to low levels, leading investors to, to engage in what's called reaching for yield, uh, where to maintain the returns in the portfolios, they ta start taking on riskier assets, pushing down the prices of those assets, uh, pushing up the prices of those assets, uh, and uh, pushing the yields down. And there's a danger that that could reverse, and it could reverse quite suddenly, and we've seen patterns of that in the, in the past. So we can't take the very low borrowing costs that Ireland uh, has at present uh, for granted. There are also, of course, domestic financial risks relating to the banking system. Again, they have been uh, covered in great detail. Uh, a number of political risks have also been talked about. Uh, but I just want to uh, focus on really on, on one. One of the key things to the recovery of the creditworthiness of the Irish economy has been the strengthening of European support policies. Not enough has happened, uh, but still significant things have happened, including the ECB's uh, OMT uh, program. Um, that has been challenged by the German Constitutional Court, but it's an, an example of the kind of setbacks that's very hard to, to predict uh, that can have big effects. So if those support policies were to unravel, and they could unravel quite quickly, again, the crisis could flare up again. So it is a sort of the general point that uh, uh, a lot of progress has been made, but a lot of that progress uh, is quite fragile. And domestically on the, uh, on the political side, again, uh, there is this sort of worrying concern uh, 
that the political commitment uh, to sort of reinforce and continue what's really brought us success in terms of uh, regaining uh, the borrowing capacity of the state uh, is showing uh, uh, worryingly uh, early signs uh, of fraying. So in terms of this fiscal framework then, sort of what is it? And uh, maybe let me say just a little bit about uh, uh, some of the politics underlying it. Because one of the things that this crisis uh, revealed was how fragile a country's borrowing capacity is within the Eurozone. If you don't have your own central bank that can lend to you, you know, in ex extreme circumstances, it makes you extremely vulnerable, and, and that's something that we saw in Ireland in 2010. Uh, so you need a lender of last resort. Uh, and since you can't uh, essentially provide it to yourself uh, uh, because you don't have control of your own central bank that can print its own uh, currency, we needed this strengthening of European support policies. But then we see this major political difficulty uh, within Europe, which is political integration is very limited. The, the level of trust and solidarity that exists within Europe is still not enough to support this sort of shared risk uh, and countries acting as lenders of last resort uh, to each other. And essentially the quid pro quo for strengthening uh, the, that lender of last resort function through various types of policies, including the European Stability Mechanism, uh, the various policies of the European Central Bank. The quid pro quo for that was that there would be a strengthening of the fiscal framework so other countries felt that they could trust uh, uh, other countries enough that they would put themselves at risk of having to make large uh, fiscal transfers uh, to them. Now, in the background paper, I go through the development of this fiscal framework, uh, uh, and it has both European and national dimensions. You're familiar with these terms, the six-pack, uh, the two-pack, and of course, we're very familiar from our referendum debate uh, on the fiscal compact or fiscal treaty. Um, it's important to note that there's also an important national dim dimension to the strengthening uh, of this fiscal framework, which as uh, Sean pointed out, I think is a key part of the institutional development that's taken place uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, so we now, under the Fiscal Responsibility Act, have our own national budgetary rule, which requires these uh, 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 adjustments in the underlying uh, or cyclically adjusted deficit. Uh, we also have a statutory framework uh, of expenditure ceilings that are designed uh, to uh, control spending. And the European and national elements are complementary. The uh, surveillance, peer pressure, <coughs> and sanctions that come with the, the European rules uh, are both reinforced or, and are reinforced by uh, the national uh, surveillance and enforcement mechanisms that now include an important role for both the Dáil uh, and the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council uh, in the process of, uh, of, of monitoring uh, those rules. And having that strong fiscal framework in place uh, really um, uh, is a way to, to, to anchor fiscal policy in a way uh, that uh, uh, maintains uh, the sort of reputation of the country as being uh, essentially a credit-worthy uh, borrower. And we shouldn't see that these, this framework as something that's been imposed in Ireland or even something that we do collectively with our European partners to make monetary union work. Uh, we should see it as something that's very much in our own national interest. And the reason for, for that are actually, there, I'm going to, to note uh, uh, a number of reasons. Uh, first of all, even though we may chafe at these constraints that seem to be uh, imposed uh, from Europe, the markets uh, that we need to borrow from to fund you know, these very large deficits and, and, and debts that we have can be much tougher taskmasters uh, as we saw in 2010 and could force much greater austerity uh, than the, uh, the rules themselves. Uh, in, in polls. In addition to that, we know in Ireland that we've gone through boom and bust cycles in the 1950s, in the 1980s, which was very much a fiscal problem, uh, and then in the noughties, which had more to do with property and credit, but did have a substantial fiscal dimension in the sense that there was a large hidden underlying structural deficit uh, because spending was increased, uh, financed initially by uh, revenues that were based on uh, property transactions. Uh, that ultimately uh, proved to be, uh, uh, to be unsustainable. So we see this cycle where we expand too much in the, in the good times and then are forced to contract too much from a good e economic management point of view in the bad times, exactly the type of cycle uh, that we've gone through. Uh, having a strong fiscal place, framework in place that's institutionalized 
as countries like Sweden and Canada did after they went through their own fiscal crises, they put in these institutions, these frameworks, uh, to allow more sustainable growth in income and employment uh, from that point on. And that's why it's so worrying to see this uh, early weakening uh, uh, of support uh, for the requirements of the framework um, uh, given um, uh, political and, and interest group pressures. A second reason uh, that having a strong fiscal framework uh, is very valuable uh, is that uh, it allows us to bring our debt down uh, from what's currently a very unsafe level of over 120% of GDP, almost 150% of GNP, uh, but allow, we really can't stay there. We can't stay at debt levels like that. It's just too dangerous, another crisis. is bound to happen at some point. Uh, so we need to bring the debt down, but we need to bring it down in a, in a phased uh, way, allowing the economy and people uh, sufficient time to adjust. Uh, and the, the framework is designed uh, to bring your, 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 your debt down uh, in a phased way over time. Uh, and related to that, uh, if you have made a credible commitment that you'll follow the framework, uh, it, it essentially takes the markets off your, off your back, uh, that you can have this more phased uh, adjustment without being forced uh, to do into uh, substantially more austerity uh, than might be forced uh, by the markets because uh, you essentially uh, have lost the reputation uh, for being able to, uh, to stick uh, to uh, a disciplined uh, fiscal policy over time. Uh, so this is a I think an institutional innovation that's really to our benefit to stop us doing to ourselves again the, uh, what we've done uh, in the past. It needs to be uh, more broadly understood. It needs more support, uh, and, and it would be fantastic to have that uh, promised support uh, from Sean and his colleagues uh, in this. It is a horrendously complex uh, framework, uh, unfortunately. It's hard for people to get too excited about it, uh, <coughs> but I do think it is incredibly important. There's a few very final thoughts then <clears throat> on what's required for Budget 2015, but it's just the, essentially the next step in terms of sticking uh, to this framework. Uh, the Fiscal Council, it's probably no secret, has argued that the original plan for doing uh, the $2 billion addi additional adjustments should be followed uh, through on. The reasons are, uh, essentially, as Fiona said, you know, the, the most basic reason is that we still have a very large deficit. It's going to be between 7 and $8 billion this year. We still have a very large debt over 120% over of GDP. Uh, so just on those numbers alone, uh, it's clear that there's uh, further adjustment to be done. Uh, in terms of meeting this key 3% target for the deficit so we can get out of the excessive deficit procedure, which is a very important milestone, uh, the government now believes because of uh, strong exchequer returns from the first half of the year, that that 3% target for 2015 could be met with something less than $2 billion. Uh, and certainly the likelihood uh, of not needing the full $2 billion to, to meet that target has increased uh, given the recent numbers. Uh, but again, we can't forget the underlying risks uh, uh, and the possibilities of setbacks. And we still have, really have a year and a half uh, of economic performance to go before we know what the ultimate number would be at the end of 2015. So there are risks and uh, uh, the more you reduce that adjustment below the $2 billion, the bigger the risk you're taking uh, of missing that key milestone, uh, which I think would be very poorly uh, received. <clears throat> uh, in addition to that, uh, a huge amount of credibility has been built around following through on uh, doing uh, what, we, what we said, and there's been this long-planned um, uh, adjustment of $2 billion for the, for the coming budget. Uh, the, IMF, the European Commission, have really taken this on board. This is, uh, uh, and uh, I think that the, the debt markets, that we would do what we said. Uh, so there is a loss of reputation uh, if the, the adjustment is scaled back. Uh, and this is a final reason, as we look beyond uh, 2015, uh, even though the worst of the fiscal adjustment should be over. But if you look at the government projections out to 2018, Expenditure is essentially, or non-interest expenditure is essentially flat in just in, in pure money terms. And this is going to be at a time when there's going to be substantial demographic pressures forcing up spending and, and, and cost pressures. Uh, so even though we're not going to have to be making the kind of adjustments we did in the past, it is not going to be, uh, going to be easy. Now hopefully the uh, comprehensive, re expend uh, comprehensive review of expenditure uh, 
will identify various uh, efficiencies uh, that will al al allow uh, um, <coughs> the, 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 the flat expenditure uh, while not compromising uh, public services and social protections uh, too much. Uh, but here I really would agree with Fiona. It does seem very premature uh, at this point, uh, given the, the, the pressures that we face, to be talking about policies that reduce revenue raising capacity. And we have to, I think, be very careful in terms of putting in new uh, uh, costly uh, programs uh, as well. Uh, so we, we, while the worst will be over uh, by 2015, there's still uh, challenging uh, times ahead, uh, and we need to, uh, to plan carefully for those and, and hopefully retain uh, the value of the, the, the fiscal framework as, a, as an institutional innovation uh, that will uh, uh, make sure that we avoid uh, making the mistakes that we've made in the past. Thank you very much.